Welcome, and thanks for joining us today. I am Kristen Hayes, and I'm the moderator for this session, Reducing and Eliminating Clabsy and Claudi, a new toolkit to the rescue. I'm joined by three subject matter experts in this work, Dr. Will Miles, Pat Posa, and Kathleen Bowman. In this session, we plan to introduce a new toolkit just released by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC. The toolkit addresses CLABSI and CAUTI reduction in the ICUs. We will discuss key components of the toolkit that can help you in your work and how the toolkit can help you to overcome common barriers that you encounter often in your daily work. As I mentioned, this ARC toolkit for preventing CLABSI and CAUTI in the ICUs was just released. The link can be seen on the screen now. The toolkit was developed as part of the ARC safety program for ICUs, preventing CLABSI and CAUTI. Hundreds of ICUs participated in this program. Will, Pat, and Kathleen engaged in this program representing SECM. Myself and others from the American Hospital Association partnered with Will, Kathleen, and Pat, as well as many others from different organizations such as the American Organization for Nursing Leadership, Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology, and the University of Michigan. Mark guided the program and found this pro from this program, the toolkit was developed to offer ICUs targeted help in reducing CLABSI and CAUTI with specific resources for units that encounter common barriers. The toolkit was built by clinicians for clinicians and informed by the frontline experience of more than 800 ICUs nationwide. The toolkit is customizable to meet local needs and demands, offers a comprehensive approach to improve team culture and change behavior, and uses evidence-based practices informed by latest research. One thing that makes this toolkit unique is that users can access materials based on their needs. There are three main access points, and you can see here on the screen, up at the top, there's the three main entry points, assess, implement, and overcome. The assess section is uh, where users can start their journey to lower infections and look at their current ICU's clinical and safety practices related to CLABSI and CAUTI prevention, identify what's working, what's not, and pinpoint opportunities for improvement. Based on this information, then a reduction plan can be created. The implement section is for improvement plans. Units that have already had a reduction plan in place access this point for a thorough walkthrough of the entire toolkit before starting your comprehensive reduction plan. And the overcome section is for those common barriers that are encountered. We all have encounter barriers and challenges after we're implementing the redu reduction plan for quite some time. And this area offers specialized assistance for uh, you to access various resources within the toolkit. Now I'd like to turn to Will, Kathleen, and Pat to ask a few questions about the toolkit. Pat or Kathleen, how does this toolkit incorporate evidence-based guidelines into the various tools inside this larger toolkit? Kristen, I'd like to answer that question, and I'm going to start off by talking about the cusp portion of the toolkit. Um, we know that in order to create sustainable change, we have to implement uh, technical evidence-based strategies, and Kathleen's going to talk about tier one and tier two strategies that are the technical strategies for reducing CAUTI and CLAPSI. But for change to be sustainable, we must also address culture, the adapt adaptive component. As Ron Heifus says, one of the most common leadership uh, mistakes is expecting technical solutions to solve adaptive problems. So this is where CUSP comes into play. Um, it works to help shape attitudes, beliefs, values of the clinicians so that they can consistently perform the way they know they should, so the cultural change. So CUSP is foundational to this program, um, and along with tiers one and two um, is necessary in, in order to achieve that sustainable change. So let's walk through the different components of CUSP. First of all, assembling the team. Next, engaging the senior executive. 
third is understanding the science of safety. The fourth component is identifying defects and then learning from those defects. And then the fifth component are implementing teamwork and communication tools. So CUSP has been effectively used in, in multiple collaboratives as well as this collaborative. Um, I was it, had the opportunity to be involved in the original work um, with the Michigan Keystone ICU um, and where CUSP was introduced in addition to the technical solutions. And um, it was interesting um, that we found um, and it has been demonstrated in the literature to be sustainable is that organizations that had put in the technical solutions but had not addressed the adaptive issues um, found significant once they did adopt CUSP and put that in foundationally, they were able to see significant reductions. Um, and at that point, it, the focus had been collapsy. So this that, that work as well as um, work in many other collaboratives as well as this one has uh, proven effective that CUSP is a key component um, to gain sustainable change. Now, I think Kathleen, I, I've overviewed the components of CUPS. I think Kathleen will talk about the evidence-based tier one and tier two strategies. Thanks, Pat. Pat. And Kristen, yeah. if you want to Share the slide. Great. So these tier interventions were developed by experts to support um, and prioritize and organize the evidence-based guidelines for CAUTI and CLAPSI. And the interventions are classified into two tiers, a tier one and tier two, and I'm going to explain what those are. They were developed based on the strength of the evidence and the judgment about the complexity of the implementation. So whether it was easy um, to make the change happen or far more complex with many more steps. Tier one interventions are more technically focused, as you can see there, um, placing the indwelling catheter for appropriate indications. Um, and these are actions that it should should occur every time with every patient. The interventions in tier one are gonna aid um, us in driving consistent application of the evidence-based practice and really work towards disrupting the life cycle of the catheter for both a urinary and uh, a central line catheter. Whereas type two interventions are more team-based strategies that extend beyond the bedside and really are there to support or enhance the tier one interventions. These strategies can be applied with varying kind of frequency to accommodate specific needs of that ICU culture or the concerns they may be having. For example, so this diagram of tier one, tier two for CAUTI, um, in tier one, let's take examples of interventions for alternatives to indwelling catheters and addressing uh, urine cultured stewardship. They focus on very specific action steps, clinical action steps that have been shown by the evidence to reduce CAUTI. Each of those components and what occurs in those components are outlined very specifically with strategies using the CUSP model to help implement and sustain. Whereas when I move to tier two, um, after I've implemented, these are strategies that I can do to augment the practices in tier one. Um, for example, conducting catheter rounds or providing the data back to staff um, so that they can work on process improvement based on information that they're identifying from their data. The additional strategies in tier two really help to promote further reduction of CAUTI and CLAPSI in the intensive care unit. And they offer actions that the team can do to ensure reliable implementation of tier one interventions to maximize um, the improvement of those technical components to, to its best possible outcome. I, it's important to note that tier two interventions are designed to be used 
in addition to tier one. So as you move to tier two, don't forget those tier one interventions. Thanks, Kathleen, and thanks, Pat, for giving us the background of uh, the evidence-based uh, uh, information that is pu pulled into the toolkit. Uh, Will, I'd love to ask um, if you might be able to share with us how do CUSP and the tiers come together to support critical aspects of the team doing the work? Thank you, Kristen. As you can see in this slide, it, it, if you use the example as ensuring proper aseptic insertion techniques, along with that, the maintenance, maintenance procedures, the CUSP concepts apply to this kind of intervention. When you understand the science of safety and really emphasizing the actual aseptic technique, especially with the use of a two-person insertion and ensuring that the staff actually supports the process, many times with the actual insertion aseptically process, everyone thinks they can, you know, insert urinary catheter sterily, but there's training that should go along with that. And, and the toolkit does provide resources and understanding this. And then in that process of placing the catheter, identifying any defects in the process, whether it's availability of the catheters, availability of the sterilization uh, components, things like that, they can be identified early enough to replace them. And engaging the senior executive is very important. Why? Because they, they can assure that the unit has access to those kits and the carts and the sterilization, as well as maintaining any of the processes should there be a higher acuity use of catheters. <clears throat> the learning from de defects, and once you identify them, it should be a real-time basis of learning from the defects themselves in the sense of identifying them and rapidly working on them and re-educate staff if they need it and have the process with champions, which we'll discuss later about trying to get that communication and understanding. And that teamwork and communication is evidence here with team steps or the process of creating that environment of mindfulness and changing the culture of the unit so everyone is addressing the patient safety. And that all these processes work together along with the tier one and tier two interventions and run in parallel so that they, they really can help change the culture to a one of mindfulness and patient safety. Well, and Will, one of the things that we found at site visits um, and rounding that concept of the immediate learn from a defect evaluation, because one of the things you hear from staff all the time is it's not connected to a human being. I'm just getting a number coming back, and I don't really see the connection of harm to that patient, and my patient's usually gone. And so one of the strategies that's been developed and that tool is going to be available, they're learned from a defect tools for Caudi and Clapsy that are part of the toolkit that when you work with your infection preventionist to ask them to call up to the unit when they're about 80% sure that it's likely going to be an infection. So the patient is still going to be on that unit. And then you do an immediate huddle. You get all the staff so you can literally see the harm that occurred and also see the practice right there in front of your face. So it's, it's a very applicable strategy to make the culture change happen. Absolutely, Kathleen. I appreciate that, that comment. And incorporating that in a real-time basis is extremely important. And the maintenance procedures, once a catheter is inserted, isn't just for maintaining sterility and aseptic components on a daily basis, but also incorporating the tier two process of reevaluating with multidisciplinary rounds the necessity of that catheter. And that's the kind of maintenance procedure of even earlier removal. And the identification, as you mentioned, of, of getting the uh, pre uh, infection preventionist involved in real-time data uh, dissemination for the staff so they can connect it to that person. And in addition to that, Will, the, um, the fact that you incorporate into multidisciplinary mm -hmm. rounds that question, is this catheter still needed? That's incorporating some of those principles of understanding the science of safety by independent checks and redundancies, um, putting it into the workflow um, will allow us to ensure that it happens each time. Yes. 
Thanks to all of you um, just for sharing just so many examples of really how this work, how the, the evidence-based guidelines can be brought to life. You know, moving from that no to do is some of the hardest of this work. Uh, many of us um, that have worked in ICUs, you know, we, we do have access to the great science right now um, and really know what the guidelines are, but moving from that no to do, that is some of what is so hard about this work. So really appreciate all of those examples that you just offered. Okay, I'm going to move us on to the next question. Um, is there something in this toolkit that is key to help teams drive change? Well, I think one of the um, pieces of the toolkit that's going to be very valuable is the overcoming challenges section. Um, and, and this is a section that you can come back to any time. Um, thinking about, oh, I'm running into this problem. Oh, that's a barrier. That's a challenge. Let me go to the toolkit and see what advice there might be. So this, what you see on the screen here is one of those tools um, that is in the, in the overcoming challenges, challenges sections. Um, so this tool is called a make it work tip sheet. And so this make it work tip sheet, um, this one's focused on engaging senior leaders in preventing healthcare associated infections. We know engaging senior leaders is foundational. That's one of the cusp principles, one of the foundations, um, but it's often a challenge. And so in this tip sheet, it reviews the issues, some common barriers. Um, this is only the first page of the tip sheet. If you flip it over, and I don't think we can flip it over on the slide, but um, what we'll see on the, the back is also some strategies for the team to use a conversation starter. How do you start that conversation with the executive leader? And then some case studies and resource links um, that will resource you to some podcasts and videos and uh, audios where um, key leaders have talked about how to engage um, leaders in this work. So it, it's that's just one of the tools. I mentioned that we also have in that um, section for um, overcoming challenges, there are also some podcasts or, and so, some videos where you can listen to other experts talk about certain topics. Um, so it, it's just great. So that addressing challenges section of the toolkit has four areas of focus, team engagement, team functioning, overcoming mindsets, and then culture. And in each of these areas, you're going to see the make it work tip sheets, some videos, some audio links as well to assist you. Um, for example, for team engagement, um, there's a video that, that talks about uh, creating team buy-in. Um, increasing ownership and engagement, and audio talking about uh, how to ensure ownership and engagement. So lots of great tools um, and organized in a way that you can go back and forth and, and find things based on what challenges you're facing in your environment, in your unit. And I have to say, this is my favorite section of the toolkit because it is jam-packed with the how to overcome those obstacles that exist in all of the environments. And literally these were created from the real life experiences that occurred during, during this collaborative um, that repetitively happened over and over again. So our ability to bring this forward and have it as a quick resource for um, teams all over the world, because this can be accessed by the internet. You don't need to be in this country um, to access it is huge. Thanks. Yeah, and Kathleen, I agree with you. This is my favorite section of the toolkit as well. And I think 
um, adding on to uh, what you had just said. I love the different variety of types of tools, like Pat talked about the fact that there's um, interviews with experts um, and videos. And, you know, I think depending on the particular situation that you find yourself in with your team in the ICU, sometimes you might grab the making it work tip sheet because you need something that's like tangible and, you know, those suggested conversations that Pat talked about might be what you need at that moment. But then, you know, watching a video and seeing a team work through something together um, just is going to hit uh, what you need at that moment. So, um, so really excited to be able to share that with um, everybody and with the work that's happening in the ICUs on a day-to-day -day basis. So, Will, I had another question. Um, how does the toolkit support the local change that people are really trying to create within their ICUs for this work? The toolkit actually provides a lot of uh, resources and uh, information to really change, make change in your unit at the local level. As an example of engaging the position champions and creating Clapsy and Caudi, this making it work tip sheet has many, many resources and involves how to affect the change at the local level. What I'm emphasizing is because every unit thinks that their barriers, especially with physician engagement, are unique, especially when you deal with the specialty type physicians and higher acuity units or higher, what is believed to be higher acuity situations. This uh, toolkit does provide all those resources. When, you, when you're talking about physicians as champions, everyone thinks that oh, let's get someone who is affable and is able to agree with what the process is. And that's great. But the examples that as this tool gives is really to get uh, a champion that is going to affect change. In many ways, the institution in when they're starting the, with the cusp principles and engaging physician groups is identifying a physician who is gonna have buy-in helping create uh, many of the processes, but also someone who is going to be able to have that difficult conversation with a group or an individual physician providing data, um, but trying to affect change and uh, uh, educate, re-educate those physician groups. They need to have connections with the chief medical officers and the quality initiatives with the senior executives. And I do want to emphasize the component about teaching academic institutions because we do need to train our trainees in the sense that it's not just the attendings, but the uh, advanced practice uh, providers, the, the residents, the fellows that may be in the unit, because in a teaching institution, as we know, the ICUs may have a rotating every month onboarding with new residents and new uh, trainees. If you identify a senior resident or one of the critical care fellows to be part of the process, and to be a resident or trainee champion, they can help onboard all of the new rotating residents and fellows, as well as provide the data that if there is a defect, they can discuss it at the resident meetings and or the M&Ms or faculty meetings and really get the buy-in by the, uh, to the rest of the residents. And most residents and fellows need to have some quality initiative uh, projects as part of the ACGM. We would have that at our facility um, on a monthly basis, where it was myself, the attending, and the fellow yes. um, that would share the initiatives that we were working on, and it happened to be Clapsy at the time, um, but being able to capture them and, and share the importance and that the staff will coach them um, to the right process and procedure uh, was a very beneficial component to um, getting them to connect with whatever improvement processes were taking place at the time. And, and if I could also say that many times institutions can provide some type of quality initiative um, components to groups and or champions, whether it's time or sometimes financial components to improve quality initiatives. But that time is very important so that champion can provide those difficult and challenging conversations and re-educate um, different groups, especially if there are mergers or other things going on in an institution. And that's one of those common barriers is that champions aren't 
afforded the time to be able to do some of the things. And that's where having the engagement of that executive leader um, and their support as, again, one of those foundational uh, components of CUSP to assist in um, ensuring that those champions do have, um, that their work is supported and that they have the time and ability to do it. It sounds as if too, one of the key parts is really just looking at your organization, looking at your unit and really um, trying to uh, meet your team and, and guide your team uh, into what is important for you. So I think some of the things that hit to me um, that you all talked about, uh, Will, you talked about you know p potentially pulling this into M&M and um, other uh, quality committee meetings and such but every organization is set up just slightly different. And so figuring out where and when and what resources um, to tap into for the work, uh, there's so many different ways that it can be done, um, but just making sure that you have those guiding principles um, and some of these recommendations uh, that might help to guide uh, making those choices to really make the, the need within your local environment. Okay. So Kathleen, when should people seek this toolkit out? Is it only for those that are starting their infection reduction journey or is there another time um, that it'll be important to, to seek these resources? Well, the exciting piece of the toolkit is really soup to nuts. <laughs> so if you are beginning the process, yes, you can do the assessment, but guess what? If I'm in the middle of the process and things are, there are certain things that are not going well, um, I may want to reassess uh, to see what pieces are missing in my particular environment. So this really applies to those people that are starting in the middle, what they believe was at the end of their journey with COVID, you know, prior to COVID, everybody's rates were really low. <laughs> and then afterwards, everybody is like having to reboot and back to the fundamentals. So um, the toolkit can really support across the board, um, and especially if you're stalled in that process. For example, um, even if you've been on that journey for a while, you, as I said, you may still want to do a gap analysis or assessment, or you may want to use one of the tools, the educational tools, if everybody's a little rusty on something, and you may want to roll that out. Um, as Pat mentioned and Will alluded to as well, there is that specific section, and that's why I'm talking about it again, because it's my favorite, the overcoming, um, that is intended, as Pat said, and Will, to be revisited frequently based on the issues that you're addressing as you move through. And many times teams and individuals know what to do, but are challenged to come up with their environment and what adaptations need to take place in their environment. And what's so fascinating with all the work that we did, and these guys can speak to it as well, a lot of our places are more similar than they are different. And so a lot of this work um, is based on a foundation of what we've consistently seen um, challenges with throughout these environments. Um, and as these guys talked about, the tools are videos, podcasts, interviews with experts, and the Making It Work tip sheet. But I wanted to share an example um, that we saw repeatedly in our site visits when we went to organizations. Most organizations had a nurse-driven protocol for removal. However, it was either being used sporadically or not fully integrated into the practice. And when we interviewed nurses, they didn't feel empowered. There were, um, it could be physician nurse communication issues. It could be unit culture issues. It could be resources that I didn't have the right alternatives. And so if, if you would go to the overcoming challenges section, you'd find a, a make it work tip sheet that's specifically associated with the empowerment component specifically associated with physician and nurse communication as a part of that, and also some um, 
the overcoming the culture of uh, just in case. Um, leaving it in just in case something happens. And so there are multiple strategies that would allow you to address one particular issue. And so I find, I find the toolkit, whether I'm starting at the beginning, I'm in the middle, or I'm stalled, <laughs> it really can meet me at all of those places. And that's the beauty of the design of it. You bring up a good point, Kathleen, in that um, a lot of ICUs in the individual basis, whether they're just one ICU or multiple ICUs within an institution, all feel that their situations are unique. And you're right that many ICUs in a region or, or are part of a system actually have some of the similar barriers, maybe different people, different situations, but their solutions uh, it, are actually quite similar. And some of the units may have already solved some of those issues using this toolkit. And it's a way to, if we can communicate and network within those units, it really does help to utilize similar situations and solving problems. Absolutely. The support that we can offer to each other and those shared experiences are so key. Um, so thank you both. So Kat, I have one more question. Uh, what is one barrier of reducing infections that this toolkit works to support? Well, so I'm all about culture. Um, and we know the impact that culture has um, on the ability to um, affect and sustain change. Um, and that's where the foundations of utilizing CUSP, and you heard me, oh, introduced the, um, the different components of that framework. And then Will gave an example of how, as you're implementing those technical solutions, how the CUSP components uh, impact. We need to have a culture that supports engagement, speaking up, um, and learning from errors and defects. That's what's key to sustainable change. Um, for example, in the um, CLAPSI work, one of the, um, key things is to ensure that you're inserting a central line using sterile technique. And one of the technical, well, the little bit technical and adaptive is to have a checklist, right? A checklist during the insertion that you have a second person in the room that's there to assist getting equipment, et cetera. Um, and then also uh, monitor how the patient is dealing with the procedure and to ensure that sterile technique is maintained and all of the components of the insertion bundle are being um, done. Well, a key strategy or a key intervention that's necessary is if something is not being done, that similar to what Kathleen was talking about, the nurse being empowered to take out the catheter, um, the person in the room, whether that be a nurse or a, another individual, needs to be empowered to um, stop the procedure um, and, and identify that there was an error or a misstep and do the correction right then. If you don't have a culture that supports that, you're not going to be able to have that safe environment where people are encouraged and welcomed to speak up. And you're going to not get the results that you need. You're not going to get the, the compliance. And so there's lots of tools in that favorite section of both Kathleen and I, um, <laughs> and Will, um, where you can um, deal with cultural challenges. Right, so under that, there are MIWs that um, talk about it's important to celebrate successes, the physician champions, the uh, executive leadership support. There's videos where your conversations with experts on how to prevent infections, empowering nurses, um, and then some audios on, on having difficult conversations when you have to um, stop the line, so to speak, um, or um, call to question um, uh, and ask clarifying questions um, related to something that's going on. So lots of good tools. We know culture change takes time, 
Um, and we're experiencing something very different. The last cohort in um, this program occurred during COVID and they experienced something totally different than the other cohorts. And, and as Kathleen identified is we probably need to step back everyone and reassess where they're at, where they're at. Remember culture is based on the attitudes and beliefs of, of people, right? And we saw a significant turnover in people. And so that turnover in people is going to change your culture, turnover in leaders, turnover in work, in staff, frontline staff, all of that, we're going to need to reestablish our culture. And so this would be a, a great time to be able to use some of the, uh, go back, do your assessment um, and use some of those tools to provide that original education, um, look to see if you have those cusp foundations in place and um, and then use some of these uh, tools to come over to overcome some of the challenges. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, yeah. The work that happens in healthcare is so complex and particularly the work that happens in ICUs is extremely complex. Um, and as you mentioned, um, these, you know, the time during COVID-19 was extremely complex for so many different reasons. And so really using those evidence-based guidelines to guide the work, but the application in different settings, um, really appreciated all the different examples that you all shared um, and ways that this toolkit could be pulled into different systems scenarios, different challenges that people are happening, and also during the different timelines of this work. The reduction of CLABSI and CAUTI is always going to be something that's in front of those that work in ICUs. And so utilizing uh, tools that really have been um, invested and informed by the clinicians that are doing the work um, is really just such a, a great thing to have in front of us. So thanks. So we have some references from the things that we talked through today, um, but we just wanted to end today with uh, thanking all of you on behalf of myself, as well as Will, Kathleen, and Pat. We're really glad that you joined us today. We hope that you're able to walk away with an understanding of how this toolkit might be able to help you and in the work that you're doing to reduce CLABC and CAUTIs. And we'd love to hear your questions. Feel free to add them into the chat and we can answer any questions that you've had um, either during the conversation or maybe something that's popped up at the end. Um, so thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Looking forward to it. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Looking forward to your questions.